Hello Internet, Seth Skorakowski, and today we're going to be taking a look at the Pulp Cthulhu scenario, The Disintegrator. Written by Alan Bly, the adventure appears as one of the four scenarios in the Pulp Cthulhu rulebook. The adventure serves as an introductory scenario to Pulp Cthulhu, offering us several classic pulp tropes like mad scientists with deadly inventions, sinister strangers, an isolated location, incredibly lethal monsters, and survival horror. It also features a lot of social interaction and roleplay opportunity. This is a roleplay heavy scenario with a lot of NPCs. While the heroes can be of any occupation or archetype, it's recommended to have at least one character with science skills. However, nowhere in the adventure does it specify which science skills or when it would be that a player character would use them, but the NPC that's designed to fill that role, if none of the player characters have filled it, has a chemistry, engineering, and physics. The scenario is pretty short, coming in at 23 pages, just 20 pages if you remove the appendix with all the NPC stats, and it's intended for two to five characters and is playable in just a single session. It's set in Kingsport in October, though the year that it takes place is never specified, so it can be anywhere in the 1920s or 1930s. It took my players and I about six hours to complete this adventure, and that was with us really taking our time with this one. We had fun, but the scenario does have a few weak points that keepers are going to want to be aware of. So what I'm going to do is offer my praises, my criticisms, and a few suggestions as a game master who has successfully run this adventure. And I'm Jack the NPC. I'm here to give it to you from a player's side of things as I get to venture into the most dangerous place a Call of Cthulhu character can ever go. An auction. But before we keep going, I must warn you that there will be spoilers. So, any players in the audience, please stop here. Send your game masters this way to see about running the disintegrator for you. But if you keep going and you spoil yourself, you'll be paid a special visit by Mr. Sleep. Okay, keepers, let's get this one started. But first, the backstory. 14 months ago, a small time inventor named George Pelfrey became lost when he and his friend Bill were hunting in the Appalachian Mountains. Taking shelter in a cave, they discovered the walls had been worked smooth and was illuminated with strange glowing crystals. Venturing deeper, they found some sort of scorched machinery. Pelfrey picked up a short metal rod that emitted a pale beam and shining it on Bill, the beam disintegrated his friend. Horrified at what he had done, he fled the cave, which was also weakened by the beam, so it collapsed behind him. The authorities discovered him wandering in a daze two days later, still clutching this metal rod. Bill's body was never discovered and was ruled death by misadventure. Pelfrey spent months trying to discover the secrets of this alien device, but his interactions with it have resulted in him receiving terminal cancer. So, desperate to make sure that his family will be financially secure after he's gone, he's dressed the device up inside of a large machine and plans to sell his disintegrator invention at an auction. The adventure begins with a telegram from the wealthy Professor Lionel Finch in Arkham. He had received an invitation to the auction, but due to his poor health, he cannot attend. He's unsure if this disintegrator is real or not, but he, if it is, he's worried that this could be used as a weapon and disrupt the fragile peace that's been maintained since the Great War. He offers the heroes a retainer of $500 each to go to the auction in his name, determine if this device is real or not, and if it is, a budget of $6,000 in order to purchase it. $500 each, and I get to stay at a big fancy hotel and buy expensive stuff with other people's money? Oh, you got it, boss. No problem at all. That disintegrator is as good as yours. Even if I have to kill for it. Now, if this is the first adventure of your campaign, Finch might be a good way of introducing the player characters to one another. Like, he's, he's summoned them all together, and this is how they meet. Otherwise, you might want to introduce them a little bit earlier in some way in some previous adventure. Or if you already have a wealthy NPC benefactor or investigator organization, you could just simply use them instead of him. Now, Professor Finch freely gives the player characters information on who George Pelfrey is, how he's been ill, and we have a full week until the auction occurs. But there's very little that the player characters can uncover if they decide to do their own research on this. Now, I know that Pulp Cthulhu isn't focused on investigation as much as Call of Cthulhu is, but I still would have liked a little bit more than this, such as we don't know exactly who else is going to be attending this auction, so maybe player characters could uh, use some of their connections and listen to some rumors, or maybe they could call the hotel and smooth talking them into saying who's going to be staying there next week. Uh, maybe a good way of uncovering uh, Pietro Morisani the, or the arms dealer Ernest Kelper than saying, 
say that they're going to be attending. And then the investigators might be able to research them and learn a little bit more because keepers get some great background information on them, but there isn't a real way that the players can learn any of this stuff. And it might be a good way for them to come into the auction knowing a little bit about some of the other attendees. The hotel itself is in nearby Kingsport, about three and a half miles from Arkham. It's in a remote cove and offers a golf course and a beach. Being October, the hotel is near the end of its season. It's going to be closing for the winter soon, so there's reduced staff and only a few other guests here. The building itself is three stories with a basement and features a huge glass conservatory. I suggest that keepers note in advance what all rooms the other NPC guests are staying in, and then let the player characters choose what types of rooms they want uh, and from what's left available, and figure out which rooms are going to be theirs. Depending on how your game goes, this might be important as they're rushing back to their rooms to get their weapons or trying to access the other guests' rooms. Also, keep us, give you players the copies of these maps. RBG players love pouring over maps. It's, it's who we are. Arriving at the auction, the player characters are given the planned schedule of events. Again, print this out for your players. Keepers, meanwhile, have their own timeline, which includes the unscheduled incidents. Now the adventure gives us a large cast of characters, 14 NPC profiles, though we only get images for nine of them, as well as a list of minor NPCs, including hotel workers and other guests. So keepers should plan to expect a lot of roleplay with this adventure, you know, letting the players get to meet and know a lot of these NPCs, especially be sure to introduce them to the hotel portal or Gabe Dyer, maybe when they're checking in. Now, one complaint that I have with this adventure is the picture of the NPCs. They're all smushed here together in a collage. And while, yeah, that's handy for keepers to glance down and be reminded of what all these NPCs look like when they're describing them, I prefer separate pictures. That way we could show these pictures to the players, and uh, that way it really does help the players differentiate who the different characters are if we show them a picture of who they are, especially when we have a large cast like this one. Shortly after they arrive, a heavy fog descends on the area. Then once all the guests have arrived and checked in, the auction begins with the unveiling of the device and a demonstration as it disintegrates a stone statue in the courtyard. The PCs are encouraged to inspect the statue beforehand, and other items might get selected to be disintegrated for other demonstrations. For our game, our players decided to hide some pennies on the backs of the statues and all the stuff getting destroyed, you know, just to see if those things were really being disintegrated or maybe they were being moved or hidden in some way. And I'm not exactly sure how pennies were supposed to tell us if that was real or not, but anyway, that's what we did. Anyway, a failed skill check meant that some of the other guests saw what we were doing and they were all like, yeah, sounds like a good idea to us, so they decided to start doing it too. So by the end of the night, all the statues and all the chairs and all the tables and all the crap that was getting disintegrated, the backs of them were completely encrusted in loose change. Also note that when the disintegrator fires, all electronics and anything within half a mile begins to malfunction, such as all the phones in the hotel go out, or a compass needle spins in place, and radios start blasting static. I'd also escalate this a little bit with each test. So maybe on the first test, all the lights around the courtyard dim. And then on the second one, all the lights in the entire hotel dim. And then by the third one, all the lights in the courtyard go out and they never come back on again. And maybe uh, watches stop working, or you know, different things like that. All the car batteries are dead. You can have just a little bit of escalation with each shot just to demonstrate that there is something else going on here. And of course, anyone who's too close to the beam's target might feel a bit nauseous as their con stats might be getting drained because this thing is pretty lethal to be around. Now after the demonstration, dinner is served. Again, we have a few hours for role play and whatever shenanigans the players might try, like breaking into to get a closer look at this disintegrator machine and seeing how it works. Now one guest who's going to be chosen by the keeper does not show up for dinner. A search of the room finds it empty but the window open, and a small search of the ground occurs, but the auction is still going to begin at 9 o'clock whether that character is there or not. Now what the players don't know is that every time this device is activated, powerful waves of energy that are undetectable by humans go out. And this serves as a flare for certain alien creatures that can detect them, and one of which is the Migo from Yugoth, who've been able to figure out what this device is and they want to retrieve it for themselves. So they've sent three Migo to Earth, who've kidnapped one of the guests, cut out their brain, read it, and have learned what's going on here. The auction itself is a two-round blind auction, where the participants write their bid in an envelope, and after which they're all read, and then we have a second round. Now, it's during the first round of this auction that an uninvited guest arrives and begins tapping on the glass doors to be let inside. He introduces himself as a Mr. Sleep, a representative of an interested party. And when told this is an invitation-only affair, he produces a bag of Revolution-era 
of gold coins and then is suddenly allowed inside because that was evidently all he needed. Now, this guy is really weird. He's hairless, he's pale, he's seven feet tall, he talks in an archaic manner, and he has this little grin like he knows a joke that nobody else is in on. And he's just all around a creepy guy. I picture him like one of the strangers from the movie Dark City. Okay guys, my finely tuned instincts tell me that this Mr. Sleep dude is a bad guy. Not only that, I think that there is something supernatural about him. I am sure Seth is going to be impressed that I pieced all that stuff together myself. He is clearly a bad guy and unnatural. I mean, that is pretty obvious. The real secret is what Mr. Sleep is, which is much harder for the player characters to figure out. He's a Shagath Lord, an ancient shape-shifting horror and one of the toughest monsters in Call of Cthulhu. Mr. Sleep knows there is almost nothing that the player characters can do that can harm him. However, he's been able to deduce what this disintegrator really is and where it came from, and he does fear this disintegrator because it does pose a very real threat for him. So he's come to collect it and keep it away from these primitive little primates who shouldn't be playing with things they can't understand. He is supremely confident that he's going to uh, acquire this by any means necessary Necessary, and he's taking a little bit of amusement with these little dramas and interactions being taking place between these dumb humans. Now, among the first round bids, one of the envelopes simply contains the message, Your Lives. Now, I assume this was put there by Mr. Sleep. It doesn't say for certain who exactly put this in there, but you probably put that in there as a joke. But the guests should start bickering about who did it as tensions start rising. So keepers, go ahead and play this up. Now, around the same time, a car of some sort comes pulling up the drive and then stops. Now keepers might want to point out that the car's headlights are still working if they had all the car headlights go out when they were doing the testing earlier, and that should seem a little bit strange. Now if the characters don't go out to investigate this, like it's somebody else's problem, the driver is going to step out of the vehicle and call to them in sort of a, a, a slurred and strange voice. And what this is is the Migo who scanned the driver's brain has pulled this name out of their memories as somebody who is inside the building, so that's the reason that it's calling for the player characters, is that was just the name that came up when the Migo was searching for a name. Now once the player characters do approach within speaking distance, they recognize Gabe the hotel porter, and in this strangely inflected tone, he delivers a message that they are all in grave danger. The disintegrator is something that they should not possess, and tells them to surrender it and they'll be allowed to live. He also warns them of a dangerous non-primate which has been detected inside the hotel, and if questioned, he only repeats this message. If he's approached, the Migo that's standing behind him withdraws it tentacle from the back of Gabe's head and then flees, leaving a large hole hollowed out in the back of his skull where he can show that it was a surgically cut open and now he's just limping on the ground. Okay guys, something hollowed out the back of that dude's skull and used him like a muppet in order to talk to us. I say we go back inside and get that disintegrator ready for a field test if you know what I mean. And what the hell is a non-primate by the way? Is that like a cat? Is there a cat in there I don't know about? Now at this point, whatever happens next is completely up to the heroes. They might pass this, pass this message off to the rest of the guests, or they might keep it secret to themselves for some reason. Now several guests are going to fight to keep this disintegrator and not surrender it over to anyone, and they're going to resort to violence if necessary. Pelfrey and his wife might confess the truth if questioned. Mr. Sleep is going to make his counter offer that the creatures outside will kill and dissect everyone, and he alone can save them if they give him the device. All he needs is to someone to carry it for him. Now if the characters take too long in deciding, the Migo attack. The two will smash the glass ceiling and then fire them from above with these weird dart launchers, and all the people that they captured from their various rooms or from the search parties that were looking for the different people that were missing, uh, they've all had their brains replaced with these biomechanical controllers, turning them into these meat puppet zombies that are come storming the hotel. If Mr. Sleep is injured, he reveals his true sanity crushing form. He is an extremely difficult opponent, and while yes, the disintegrator will work on him, the device is pretty slow and difficult to aim, and it has to be held on him for several rounds, and that can be tricky. There is no correct way of completing this adventure. Maybe the player characters will team up with some of the NPCs and take on the monsters that are storming the place. Uh, maybe they'll strike a deal with one side or the other. That is all completely up to them. However, a couple things here. First, while this is Pulp Cthulhu and the heroes are likely to have guns, that is, doesn't necessarily mean that the player characters have their guns on them.
them. It's usually frowned upon to come strolling into an auction with a shotgun or tommy gun under your arm. So maybe the player character's weapons are stashed in their hotel rooms or their cars. However, a fancy hotel like this one that's got the, the different cove and all the sailing and everything like that, it probably offers skeet shooting as well. So I would add that in the basement is where the double barrel shotguns have been stored for the off-season shutdown. So there should be shotguns down there for all the skeet shooting events. Next, once two of the Migo are killed, the third one flees back to the barn where their teleportation gate back to Yugoth is hidden. Now, when they close this gate, the barn explodes, and it's very dramatic and very unfortunate for anyone remotely close to this barn at the time. But I also added that the bioengineered controllers and all of the meat puppets' heads also exploded at the same time. Not enough to hurt anyone unless they're engaged in maybe like close melee combat with them, but definitely dramatic as all these creatures, just all their heads just suddenly detonate and they fall to the ground. It's an idea that I stole from the Adventure Dissociation, and I think it's a, a really cool way of saying that the Migo have left the building. Maybe the heroes will defeat Mr. Sleep, the aliens and their zombies, and the arms dealer with his goons and retrieve the disintegrator. Their sanity will be restored or lowered accordingly to whatever they do. Overall, this is an okay adventure. It's more of a huge encounter and survival horror than anything else. We have a lot of setup with uh, very little investigation involved, and then we're faced with multiple opponents all coming after the same item. It does serve as a good short introductory adventure, but it isn't what I would consider a great adventure. It touches on some some of the pulp tropes, but the biggest one, the weird science device, isn't a weird science device at all. It's simply a mythos artifact that's been dressed up as a weird science device. Why I say should have had some weird science devices is that arm stealer. I mean, sure, his bodyguard had a fully automatic mouse, but yeah, those things existed in real life. Nothing too weird science about that. So maybe if he had something like a briefcase where he pushed a button and a pistol sprang out and he caught it and shot somebody with it. Or maybe a briefcase where he pushed a button and it unfolded into some sort of weird submachine gun like a transformer or something. Or maybe that goofy cod piece gun like in From Dust Till Dawn. I mean, that thing is pure pulp right there. While the adventure isn't one that I'd recommend that Game Masters just run out and buy, it does appear in the Pulp Cthulhu rulebook, which I do highly recommend people picking up the Pulp Cthulhu rulebook, so if you've got Pulp Cthulhu, then you already have this adventure, so might as well give it a try. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews or Game Master Toolbox, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, heroes, you have a great day. You know, you forgot to mention how in our group, two of the player characters are super wealthy, and one of them bought that mansion at the end of Crimson Letters, and another player character bought this hotel at the end of this adventure. I mean, with all the damage and the dead bodies and all the lawsuits, he picked it up for a steal. That's why we got so distracted buying furniture when we played Angel Tears, because we were trying to get some nice stuff to soup up our places. Novice Call of Cthulhu characters, they burn a place down once they're done with it. But veteran Call of Cthulhu characters, they know how to invest in real estate.